On a Sunday night a couple of weeks ago, I was aimlessly scrolling YouTube to find something to watch, and I stumbled upon something I didn't expect. Persistent deflation for a third straight month. On a year basis, consumer prices were the slowest since 2009. <laughs> Grappling with a mounting debt crisis as investors ramp up calls for fiscal stimulus to boost the economy. I was confused, because I'd just read the day before that China had grown their economy by 5.2% in 2023. So I decided to dig a little deeper. Well, it started out that way, but the more I read, the deeper I went. And what I learned completely reshaped everything I knew about China's economy. China is facing a spiraling debt crisis and a period of deflation which could very well end their 45 years of economic growth and reform. And there isn't a simple reason why this is happening, but rather a compounding of policy decisions, unexpected spread of disease, market euphoria, lies and mistakes. What started as just a minor curiosity ended with me doing the most research that I've ever done for a video. So let me take you through the cracks forming in every corner of of China's economy and how it paints a dire picture for the future of the country. Today, China is the world's second largest economy, but it certainly wasn't always like that. The People's Republic of China was founded in 1949 by a Marxist dictator called Mao. Mao modelled the country's economy off the communist policies of the Soviet Union. There was no private property and no market economy. Instead, skilled workers were allocated jobs and their wages were not dictated by supply and demand, but by the government. This was a deeply flawed economic model, but it was made so much worse by how impoverished China was in the 50s. In 1959, China entered a deep famine that lasted until 1961. Real figures on the famine are unknown, but current estimates say that about 30 million people died in just two years. And over the course of his reign, Mao is estimated to be responsible for up to 80 million deaths. Mao died in 1976 and two years later China had a new leader, Deng Xiaoping. He led China for 11 years and began making sweeping economic reforms that would kickstart the longest and most successful period of economic growth in human history. He started introducing special economic zones, allocated cities where market capitalism was allowed to thrive. And the first of these cities was Shenzhen, a city that today is one of the most powerful economies in the world, a global hub for trade, technology, and finance. But for now, it was just an experimentation ground for the principles of capitalism. Before stepping away from his leadership, Deng chose two people who he wanted as successors. The first was Jiang Zemin. He ruled China from 1989 until 2002, and again, China continued to make strides in economic development. GDP growth accelerated, bringing the nominal figure to 1.2 trillion US dollars by the year 2000. And real GDP was growing at double digits almost every year. In 2003, Deng's second requested successor took over the country. His name was Hu Jintao. And once again, China experienced another decade of impressive growth. And in 2011, Hu's last year as leader, they surpassed Japan to become the second largest economy in the world with a GDP of $7.5 trillion. 2012 was the year Xi Jinping took control of China, and initially he was seen as another market reformist. He wanted free markets to play a bigger role in the allocation of resources. By 2015, the World Bank reported that China had reduced the share of population living in poverty from 88% in 1981 to just 0.7%. Almost a billion people pulled out of extreme poverty in just 35 years. The progress that China has made is astonishing, but it is still a very deeply communist country. And in 2017, she began reversing some of the reforms, increasing state control over markets in some ways. An important part of China's economy are their state-owned enterprises. And in 2017, the National University of Singapore reported that they had more SOEs than any other country in the world. In 2019, more than 60% of China's market cap was from state-owned companies. And in 2020, 40% of China's $14.9 trillion GDP came from them. We'll talk more about these later in the video because they do actually play a vital role in some of the economic problems that China faces today. 
The company's name is Evergrande, China's second largest property developer. The company is on the brink of collapse. China's stock markets are reeling with six trillion dollars wiped off the value of Chinese and Hong Kong stocks. In the last few years, China has been plagued by crisis after crisis. From the destruction of the jobs market as a result of excessive COVID policies, to the complete collapse of a thriving real estate market and over six trillion dollars erased from public companies. These events didn't just happen randomly. They're actually the direct result of critical policy decisions, market speculation, and greed. They tell a story of a crippling economy that is converging into the biggest debt crisis in the world and the potential for a return to stagnation in the coming years. And if you're enjoying the video, I'd love for you to hit the subscribe button. It tells YouTube that you'd like to see my new videos appear on your homepage recommendations. The COVID-19 pandemic hit China's economy hard in 2020. GDP growth fell from 6% in 2019 to just 2.2% as the pandemic hindered consumer demand, production and private business investment. But they did still manage to grow, despite the US, for example, seeing negative 2.8% GDP growth. So how is this even possible? Well, the answer actually lies in how GDP is calculated. One method is to add up the total of personal consumption by the Chinese population, business investments, government spending, and net exports of goods and services. In 2020, China dramatically increased its investments, mostly through state-owned enterprises, which offset the collapse of personal consumption, all paid for with lots and lots of debt. This will be really important a little later when we talk about China's current debt crisis and how they're hiding some of their economic problems. In 2021, China bounced back with GDP growth of 8.4%. But when COVID resurged in in 2022, Xi Jinping enforced the zero COVID policy, a radical shutdown of the country that drove economic growth back down to 3%, again supported heavily by increased investment spend. The zero COVID policy did permanent damage to a lot of the provinces in China, with lots of foreign companies shutting down their China-based operations and laying off workers. In 2020, net exits of foreign invested enterprises was 63,000, and in 2021, the number of companies exiting, net of new companies, was 61,000. And in hindsight, COVID was the least of China's worries. They were about to deal with one of the worst real estate collapses on record. Like most housing collapses, the story began many years earlier, in this case, in the mid-90s. China's economic reforms had been pulling millions of people out of poverty and into the middle class. So demand for middle-income housing was picking up in a big way. In 1994, China introduced a new model for property developers, where they'd be able to sell apartments before they had been finished, or even, in some cases, before the projects had even begun. And one of those property developers was a company called Evergrande. Founded in 1996, their model was to borrow money from lenders and receive prepayments from customers. They then build the property, sell it to the customers, and use the proceeds to cover their debts. And they were very successful at it. By 2021, they had 1,300 projects running across 208 Chinese cities, generating property revenue of $76 billion and making them the second largest property developer in China. But this also came with consistently growing debts. And in that year, their liabilities owed to Chinese banks and foreign investors reached $305 billion. The problem was that the property market in China was becoming a bubble. People had seen the massive massive increases in home prices and apartment prices, and were beginning to speculate on them going up further. Xi Jinping didn't like this at all, so in 2021, he decided to clamp down on developers' borrowings. In essence, this change restricted property developers from rolling their previous debts into new debts. Or in other words, they had to sell assets or come up with cash in order to pay down their current debt. Evergrande started missing debt payments in late 2021, according to S&P Global, who declared them in default on the 17th of December. Evergrande continued to sell assets through 2022 to meet its obligations, but eventually filed for bankruptcy on August 17th, 2023. Evergrande is just one example of the broader shock that was hitting the property market in China. Since 2021, a total of 53 developers have collapsed. 34 of the 50 biggest non-state-owned developers have become insolvent, and the default rate for Chinese real estate US dollar bonds is now over 50%.
This is a very serious and ongoing problem in China. The property market currently represents about 30% of the Chinese economy and about 70% of household wealth. So as property prices have declined, it's had a major impact on the wealth of its people. But China's problems aren't just limited to property. According to Fortune, a total of $6.3 trillion have been wiped off the value of Chinese and Hong Kong stocks since their peak in 2021. And Tokyo has surpassed Shanghai as Asia's biggest equity market. Trouble in the real estate market and and the once again rising political tensions between the US and Chinese governments are some of the main reasons why people believe that investors are pulling out of equity markets. But hold on a minute. I started this video by stating that China's GDP growth in 2023 was an impressive 5.2%, a figure that, excluding 2021, the US hasn't seen since the year 2000. Well, as promised, this investigation into China's economy completely reshaped the way that I think about economic data, the way that it can be manipulated or used to mislead people about what's really going on. The 5.2% figure isn't everything that it seems. And after looking behind the curtains, I found a country with a crippling and worsening debt crisis, high levels of joblessness and a collapse of middle-class wealth, which is driving China into a period of deflation that might be difficult to escape. Back in 2014, according to the IMF, China's national debt to GDP ratio was just 41%. In 2022, their debt had ballooned to 14 trillion US dollars, or 77% of GDP. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. Not only does China have a large amount of official government debt, there's also estimated to be trillions of dollars in hidden debts too. You see, the central government in China, like most governments, puts budget caps on local governments to limit how much they can spend. But provinces in China have found a way around this by using something called a local government financing vehicle. They're essentially a kind of business entity that allows local governments to sidestep their budgets and take on more debt than they're officially allowed. As you might expect, the data on this is incredibly foggy. But one estimate from Gaosheng puts the total liabilities at 11.3 trillion US dollars in 2022. And an estimate from Bloomberg has China's total debt to GDP at almost 300%. According to Gaosheng, about a third of these financing vehicles were unprofitable in 2022. So we can start to see what's really been driving the Chinese economy. Debt. Remember that graph we looked at earlier which showed which types of spending contributed to GDP growth? Well, personal consumption, spending by everyday people, has been contributing a diminishing amount to economic growth for years. Most of the growth is being fueled by investment, government investment funded by debt. An Oxford economic study reached a similar conclusion, estimating that 40% of GDP is being driven by investment double that of the US. The problem with becoming overly dependent on government investment for your economic growth is that it starts to hurt productivity with poor investments. The GDP return per Chinese yuan of additional debt has been declining for years. Or in other words, China is driving its growth by borrowing money and making lots of investments. But their excessive spending on these investments means that they're investing in a lot of projects that won't make the country any money back. Two thirds of corporate debt in China is held by state owned enterprises, many of which are unprofitable and inefficient. Some of them are state-owned property developers, currently taking huge losses in the property crisis. So while headline GDP tells the story of a slowing but continued growth, at the consumer level, it's a completely different situation. Bloomberg reported recently that a deflationary environment is forming in China, with the consumer price index falling for three straight months. It's being driven by weak demand at the household level, for starters, the real estate collapse has essentially reversed the wealth effect that households felt for many years as property prices rose. With 70% of household wealth in real estate assets, it's had a major impact on consumer confidence. The jobs market in China has also gotten a lot worse. Youth unemployment, which was 10 to 12% before COVID, ballooned to over 21% in the middle of 2023. It's recently fallen to 14.9%, but only after China changed 
the way that it defines a student in its calculation. There's currently a huge oversupply of college graduates competing for fewer and fewer jobs. The result is that households and consumers have a very pessimistic view of the future. So they're choosing to save money instead of spend it. Less spending has led many businesses to slash their prices in order to sell their inventory. A general decline in prices might not seem all that bad, especially if you live in one of the countries that's recently experienced a massive increase in the cost of living, but deflation is actually considered much worse than inflation because lower prices mean businesses make less money, so wages go down and people get laid off. So households have even less money to spend and the cycle worsens. Deflation also makes the current debts held by households, businesses and governments bigger in real terms. Households, for example, might see prices and wages go down, but the value of the debts they owe will stay the same. So it looks like those debts are bigger relative to their income and therefore relatively harder to pay down. The silver lining in all of this is that almost all of China's debt is state-owned. State-owned banks lending to state-owned enterprises or local provinces with their own currency. So the government can print its own currency and cover those obligations a very inflationary strategy, but that's the least of their concerns right now. And ultimately, while this was a fascinating deep dive, official economic data, including debt estimates, have been patchy at best and completely unreliable at worst. The Economist Intelligence Unit investigated how China only recently changed how they measure some parts of GDP to reflect the agreed best practices. So the real story of the Chinese economy could be very different from how it looks from the outside. Side. An enormous amount of research went into this video, so if you enjoyed it, the best way you can support me is simply by hitting the subscribe button, or even better, check out some of my other videos here.